from sanctification has to do with one being set apart. And holiness has to do with one being set apart, amen, and dedicated to, separated and dedicated to. And certainly we have been, by the grace of God, we have been dedicated to his service, amen, through um, the New Testament plan of salvation. God has brought us out, as one, as one uh, songwriter said, without a doubt. And so with that, we all have this great opportunity of knowing who he is in these last days. I think somebody was mentioning the um, dealing with the signs of our times and the fact that um, we are living in the last days and the Lord is soon to come. I know we've been hearing that for many, many years, but we are this one step closer to his soon arrival. Um, and there was a time in, in Pentecostal circles where you almost never um, heard a sermon where the mentioning of the coming of Jesus was not um, talked about. Praise the Lord. And for some people that may be a dreaded occasion, but for those that are living in hope, um, that is a joyous occasion. Can the church say amen? And we are, so, we are certainly uh, looking for him to come. And we have hope in Christ, not only, and I'm quoting the scripture different, but we're, we have hope in Christ, not only in this life, and we won't be miserable. Can the church say amen? And so we thank him tonight because he is certainly faithful and worthy to be glorified. We are going to be having our family and friends day uh, this Sunday. Amen. I'm looking for a high time in the Lord. Amen. Looking for souls. Amen. To be baptized in the name of Jesus and to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And for the heavens to begin to rejoice. Can the church say amen? I'm going to try to wrap this up tonight. We've been uh, dealing with the seven... The seven uh, fruit of repentance, um, and we have gotten down to the last fruit, which deals with revenge. Revenge um, is the principle that we're going to talk about tonight. Let's go to, uh, as a place to start, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapters number 7, and we're going to read um, verses numbers 11, and then we'll move on from there. And as I've uh, spoken about um, every time that I think we open up uh, this particular study that Paul, as it were, writes to the Corinthian church the second time. Second Corinthians is a follow-up of, of course, First Corinthians for the purpose of getting the Corinthian church to see their errors, their indiscretions, and to call to mind their folly and get them to repent. And after they, of course, repented, he writes to us these seven fruit that we have been dealing with for, I think, about six Bible studies. This will be the last one tonight. Um, these seven fruit that he points out here in the book of, of 2 Corinthians, chapters numbers 7. And uh, we'll, I guess we'll just go ahead and start with um, verses numbers um, 8, and then we'll read down to verses numbers 11. But he gives this to them for the sole purpose of getting the Corinthian church to see the error of their ways and to turn unto God. And the Bible said in one place, I think it was in Romans chapters number 2, verse 4, it is the goodness of God that leadeth thee, that is all man, to repentance. The term repentance in your Bible has to do with turning. Praise the Lord. It is a turning from and a turning to. We turn from one direction into the next, the other direction. And so this is what um, the Apostle Paul is dealing with in the scripture um, and in as much as after the Corinthian church was made sorry, as he said, with a letter, uh, they turned back to God and therefore um, were, was able to recover themselves. So let's read here in verses numbers 8 through 11 and then we'll get into the last principle tonight, which will be Revenge. Can the church say amen? What did it say here? Read. For though I made you sorry in a letter, I do not repent. What he's saying is that I do not turn. Read. Though I had, uh, though I did turn, or though I had a desire to turn, because what you have to realize is that when he wrote the first letter, it caused him to sorrow. Inasmuch as when Paul had to chastise the church, he, as a pastor, did not want to do that. 
but in as much as he was going to do the job as their pastor, he had to correct the situation. Can the church say amen? Read here. Although I did repent, mm -hmm. for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry. That is the first one. Though it were but for a season or a space of time. Now, the, your Bible said in the book of Ecclesiastes, there, as it were, there's a time and a season for everything under the sun. There's a time for happiness, and there's a time for mourning. There's a time for joy, and there's a time for sadness. There's a time for peace, and there's a time for war. So this, the first letter was only supposed to make them sorrowful for a season. Can the church say amen? But after they got, um, got as it were, the picture, and God began to deal with them, and they made the corrections, their sorrow turned to what? Joy. Can the church say amen? All right, read. Now I rejoice, not that ye were made sorry, but yet ye sorrow to repentance. Read. For ye were made sorry after a godly sort. So godly sorrow will only make you sorrowful for a season, as it were, to sorrow unto repentance. Can the church say amen? Read. That ye might receive damage by us in nothing. The reason why he says that is because inasmuch as if he did not write the letter, he would have been, would, would have been damaging the church. So when he wrote the letter, they didn't receive any damage by him in anything because he, he um, as it were, helped repair the situation that was happening within the church at Corinth. Can the church say amen? And I think I made, I made the point to us a few um, number of Bible studies that the, uh, the church at Corinth was Paul's church. He was the pastor of that church. Can the church say amen? All right, read. For... For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Read. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. There's two types of sorrow. Read. For the self same thing. Read. That ye sorrow after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. What clearing, uh, yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this manner. These are in your Bible what is referred to as the seven fruit of repentance. Now we're going to get into the last fruit here, which deals with revenge. The term revenge deals with um, the taking of action against the flesh to seek uh, restitution, as it were, and vindication against the, uh, the flesh. Now, this is what Paul was dealing with the church in as much as to get them to see. And this is what happens from time to time, that when a person has an issue and they fall into transgression, God wants them to take revenge against the, of the offender, the offender. And in many cases, the offender is simply the carnal man, the nature. And this is what this particular fruit has to do with. It take, has to do with one taking revenge against that which has caused the offense to happen. Praise the Lord. And many people, you'll find, out, you'll find this out, saints, um, many times, many of the struggles that people have in their life is not the devil. In many cases, it is the flesh. Praise the Lord. I think it was Paul said in one place, when, um, when I was under the law, the motions of sin, that's in, the, I think, the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, if I'm not mistaken, the seventh chapter, I'm sorry, that the motions of sins was in his members. Well, he's talking about the actions, the deeds was in his members. That had nothing to do with Satan. Satan is simply the tempter that comes to try to entice us. But if a man has, if a, a man, man in this world, saints, needs no help from anybody to corrupt himself. Can the church say amen? So the, so the seventh fruit of repentance has to do with an individual simply taking restitution, seeking restitution from their flesh. This has to do with 
the mortifying of the deeds of the body. Praise the Lord. This has to do with one putting themselves on a fast. This has to do with one praying, one seeking God and asking help for their situation. As I said before, that we have to partner with God. What that means is this. There are certain things that God does and there are certain things that we do. Can the church say amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. So when it, come, when it came to the Corinthian church and the issue that they were struggling with, they had to partner with God and they had to say, okay, this is what caused me or us or whatever the case may be to fall into the issue at hand. So if I'm going to get the issue fixed, I have to also do something about it. Now, I, I, we taught a Bible study, probably a couple of them, and showed that there was about seven things or more in which the Corinthian church was plagued with. And so Paul addressed that in his first letter. Praise the Lord. And one of the things that they had to do once they heard Paul's teaching, then they had to say, okay, now I'm going to take restitution against that which has caused the offense. Can the church say amen? amen. Let's go to Galatians chapters numbers um, five. Can the church say amen? We're going to finish this up tonight, um, and then we're going to move on. Praise the Lord. This will be the last Bible study on this subject. Praise the Lord. Now, whenever God deals with man, he always deals with, men, with man out of love. God does not deal with us to destroy us. Can the church say amen? Your Bible said it is not God's will that any should perish, but all will come to repentance. The love of God compelled him to act on our behalf. And the love that God, I mean that, uh, excuse me, Paul had for the Corinthian uh, saints caused him to act on the behalf as their pastor. Can the church say amen? I said Galatians, didn't I? Galatians 5, all right. Let's look at this now. This is going to describe the, the internal battle that happens within every man. Paul describes this battle prior to his conversion in the seventh chapter of the book of Romans. See, some people have interpreted that chapter as to deal with him as a saint. No, Paul was talking about the internal battle that happened to him prior to his conversion. That's what he's talking about. Because once we are saved, we have something in us that helps us fight that which is in our atomic nature. So let's look at this tonight. Let's, uh, let's read from verses, let me see here, verses number 16. Let's read. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He says, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In the 8th chapter of Romans, he talks about the same um, situation. He talks about the carnal mind. The Bible said the carnal minded man as it were, the carnal-minded, as it were, man is enmity against God. Can the church say amen? Those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, what God does through the baptism of the Holy Ghost is that he influences the mental makeup of all men. This is what the baptism of the Holy Ghost does. It comes to influence the way we think. It comes to influence the way we process our paradigm. Praise the Lord, so that we will not fulfill the lust that is in every man. The term lust simply means strong desire. What people have to understand is that once a person is saved, their body did not forget what it was. And I tell, I, and, and, and so Paul is making mention here of the, he's going to talk about the internal battle that goes on in every man. Now this happens when you are in the body of Christ. What people don't understand, sometimes people feel like, well, you know, I got this issue and I'm not supposed to feel this way. Well, if you don't feel what is in you, then maybe what is in you is working, um, how can I say it, is, is working physically out of you and you're doing what you shouldn't be doing, that's the reason why you don't feel it. Am I making sense? So if I feel my nature at times is because I'm trying to, I'm working to get my nature under control. Now, I'll tell you how Jesus said it like this. This is how Jesus said it. Um, I'm trying to get the scripture, but he talked about saints. If all men love you, as it were, if all men speak well of you, then 
the life of that individual is suspect. Why? Because it's obvious that they are in line with those that are not speaking against, against you. Because your Bible said, and this is what Jesus told his disciples, he says, they, don't, they, don't, they didn't love me and they won't love you. Can the church say amen? So many times we have to understand that you are supposed to feel your nature bothering you. And then once you, when you feel your nature bothering you, you war against it through the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Can the church say amen? It's going to rise up. And if it does not rise up, then the carnal nature is what is in control. Can the church say amen? And so what happens is that when my nature begins to act up, the spirit begins to warn me. Can the church say amen? The spirit gives me signs. It shows me. It tells me what I need to do. And so what happened with the Corinthian church is that they were walking as men. Paul talked about they walk as men. What that means? They were walking by the dictates of their carnal nature. Can the church say amen? Your nature didn't leave you once God filled you with the Holy Ghost. It is still there. The propensity to do all that I used to do is still there. Bishop Paddock said it like this. The flesh is as vile as vile can be. That's why he said make no room, as it were, I think he talked about for Satan, if I'm not mistaken. Make no room for or give an occasion to. Why? Because the carnal nature did not leave. It's this under subjection. Can the church say amen? And the way to, as we talk about this seventh fruit, the way to keep that nature under subjection is to take revenge, restitution, vindication against it. Does that make sense? And I'm going to talk about this as we move on. The way you do that is fast. That is the way that we take revenge, restitution, and seek payment against this. It is the one tool that God has given us, that in prayer, to help keep this under subjection. Can the church say amen? So let's look at this. He says, this I say then, walk in the spirit, read, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Ye shall not fulfill it. The term ye here is always plural, never singular. So this is to the church, to all of us. Read, for the fl uh, flesh lusteth against the spirit. That has to do with the flesh is contrary. It is fighting the spirit. This spirit here is your renewed spirit. It is the baptism of the Holy Ghost that he's given you. Your renewed mind, I should say. Your renewed mind. Can the church say amen? Read. And the spirit uh, against the flesh. So there's a, there's a fight here, right? What did Paul tell us? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. And I tell people all the time, all of us saints have to fight for our faith, personally. We have to fight our own mind. We have to fight our own desires. We got to fight, praise God. We have to put up the good fight of faith. Can the church say amen? amen. And he said, lay hold on what? Eternal life. See, some people think once they get saved, they, they done fight. No, when you get saved, you've, you, that's when you start fighting. Can the church say amen? Because the enemy really is not dealing or fighting the world. He's fighting the church. He wants that which God desires. And I taught, we taught a Bible study on that before. How he wants the most precious thing that God has. And that's his people. He wants to ascend up to the sides of the north and take over the church. Can the church say amen? So we have to fight. Can the church say hallelujah? Paul tells Timothy, as a, uh, endure hardness as a good soldier. For who? Jesus Christ. So it denotes that we are soldiers. And the church say amen. amen. And I got to fight every day. I got to fight like, <laughs> like forever and ever, as they say. Can the church say amen? Read. What did he say? And these are what? Contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the thing that ye would. See, we can't do the thing that we would because if we did the thing that we would, or we shouldn't do, then we would be out of the will of God. Can the church say amen? amen. Read. But if, but if mm -hmm, what do he say? If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are, uh, ye are not under the law. Read. What did he, 
Now, the works of the Spirit, now they are, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think there are 17 works of the, of the flesh that you will see here. We, we're not going to talk about them all. We're just going to read them. And I have definitions, but I'm not going to get into all of that tonight. It will take too much time. But he says here, now the works of the flesh, this is what is manifest out of two things, the physical body and the human spirit. Paul said it like this, all sin save fornication is a sin of the body. What that means is this, every sin that a man does outside of physical fornication, which is a sin against the body, everything else comes out of the human spirit. Praise the Lord. The human nature, the human spirit, the human, the, the human spirit or the mindset that man has prior to being saved. Does that make sense? I hope I didn't confuse anybody. This is what Paul tells us in another place. Read, now the works of the uh, flesh are uh, manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idol uh, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emula uh, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, reviling, revi uh, reviling and such like. Any, anything that is similar to or like these. Read. Mm -hmm. For that which I tell you before. So it's obvious he said this before. Read. As I have also told you in times past mm -hmm, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now what is the kingdom of God in your Bible? It's the church. Can the church say amen? The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither can you say, lo, here, lo, there. The kingdom of God is what? Within you. So the kingdom of God is the church. So those that um, indulge in these practices are, of course, walking in the flesh and not in the spirit, not taking restitution, is not taking action against their carnal nature, and they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Can the church say amen? And, if, and the kingdom of God will come for us when we are raptured out of the earth. We will make it. Can the church say amen? Yeah, oh, hallelujah. It's going to happen. Whether people believe it or not, I know, I know Oprah and all of them are talking about humanism and all this other stuff, but I don't care what they're talking about because I'm not going where they're going. Can the church say amen? I'm going with Jesus when he comes. Can the church say amen? So if you want a definition of these things, I could give them to you, but I don't want to bog down time tonight, so we're going to keep moving on because I have a, a lot of scripture to get to. Let's go to Romans, uh, chapters, numbers... Um, Six, we're talking about revenge tonight. Can the church say amen? This is what Paul was trying to get them to do. Take revenge. Can the church say amen? Against the nature. This is the last fruit of repentance. Praise the Lord. This is looking introspectly. Amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Eighth chapter, sixth chapter of Romans in verses numbers uh, 8 through 13. Can the church say amen? amen? This chapter deals with us being born again, as it were. Can the church say hallelujah? What did it say here? Now we, mm -hmm, he says, now if we be dead with Christ, mm -hmm, we shall also live with him. If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. When did we die with him? The Bible said that dead things are formed from beneath the waters. When we were baptized in the name of Jesus, we were buried with him, and this chapter says this, by baptism. It's like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we should also rise to walk in the newness of life. So when a person is buried with him, the old man is buried. The old man is underneath the waters. We rise through the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and we have a what? Newness of life. He's saying if we were buried with him, we shall also what? Live with him. Can the church say amen? Now, I'm going to tell you something about living. If we're going to live with him, the Bible said he that has ceased from sin has suffered in the flesh. Remember, when Jesus was down here, saints, he ceased from, from the practices around the world, me, uh, around him. He didn't indulge in everything that everybody else indulged in. And because of that, he was able to be a perfect sacrifice and example for all of us. Can the church say amen? And now we can do likewise because we have followed the, the same example that he gave us. 
And this is what li living life with God is all about. It's about following his example and living the way he lived. Can the church say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Read. Knowing that Christ being risen from the dead dieth no more. The Bible said it is appointed unto man once to die. You know why he said that? It's because those of us who are born again of water and of spirit, we're not going to die again. Praise the Lord. We died once. We're not going to die again. Praise the Lord. We're going to, the next thing that we're going to see is life. Because the Bible said that this mortal shall put on immortality. Praise the Lord. This body is going to die. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to die. And we're going to be raised in life. Can the church say amen? And as much as he, uh, what verse was I in? Nine. Knowing that Christ being risen, right from the dead, dieth no more. Read, death have no more dominion over him. Death has no more dominion over him, and it should have no more dominion over us. And it will have no more dominion over us because we are now following his like example. We are now a part of the church. Can the church say amen? Read, for in that he dieth, he dieth unto sin once. Read, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Mm -hmm. Likewise, reckon ye yourself to be dead indeed to sin. What he's saying, reckon ye yourself to be dead indeed to sin. And I like to say it like this. I tell people, when a, a dead man has no feelings. Can the church say, when a man dies, he has, he has no feeling. He doesn't even know he's dead. And if I am dead, if I died out in Christ and I have a new life, then in terms of my feelings, in terms of the flesh, when I'm feeling certain things, it must be obvious that I need to die some more. Can the church say amen? Because if I'm feeling certain things and I'm supposed to be dead, and a dead man feels nothing, then why am I feeling this? I am feeling this because the old man wants to what? Revive. And this is, this is the kicker. The kicker is this. Sometimes people think, well, I killed me yesterday, so I'm dead. Remember, every time that I wake up, every time that I look in the mirror, that old man is looking back at me. Can the church say amen? So the point here is that if Christ died, praise God, and sin have no dominion over him, then likewise for those that are dead with Christ. Because the Bible said that we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. Jesus suffered on the cross, we also have a cross to bear. See, discipleship doesn't come with kudos, it comes with a cross. Can the church say amen? You, you, what did Jesus say in the eighth chapter of the book of, uh, I think it was, of St. John? He said, if any man will come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. Can the church say amen? But the difference between um, being in the world and being in the church is that he will bear your burdens with you. Can the church say amen? And the scripture said his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Can the church say amen? He will bear the load with us as we walk with him. Can the church say amen? He's there with us. He loves us. The church is the most important thing to God. And this is the reason why Paul wrote like this, because he was trying to get the church to see that you are important to God. And you have to take revenge against yourself. Now, this term revenge does not mean I take revenge against you. I take revenge against myself. Can the church say amen? And whenever somebody has fallen into um, transgression or sin, they have to take revenge against themselves. And it is a precautionary measure that we take to make sure that we don't get ourselves in the same predicament that we did before. So I tell my flesh, no, you're not eating today. You're not going to eat today. You're going to read your Bible. You're going to pray. You're going to fast. You're going to exact your labors. Praise God. You're not going to exact your labors, excuse me, and you're not going to take pleasure. We're going to talk about that tonight. Can the church say amen? This is 
what this seventh fruit teaches us. That sometimes I have to hurt that which, is of, that which was offensive. Can the church say amen? And what people have to understand, that in these bodies, the Bible said there's no good thing. Praise the Lord. There is nothing profitable in my body other than the fact that I have to live down here in this body to, for God to perfect my soul and get me ready for the rapture. That's the only reason why I got a body. I don't have no body for no other reason. Can the church say amen? The bodies that we have, saints, are this for that purpose. It is for God to make us into what he wants us to be as we walk down here in time, and eventually we got to give these bodies up. And, and, and as we age, praise the Lord, don't you want a new body? <laughs> I wish I could still grow hair, but you know when I get to heaven, I won't have, to, I won't have a problem with hair because I won't need any. I'm fighting, running, trying to lose weight. When I get to heaven, I won't have no weight issues. I'm talking good tonight. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So sometimes I got to take revenge against myself so that I can be what God wants me to be. And that's what Paul was trying to get the Corinthian saints to understand. Can the church say amen? Read here. Let's finish. What, what did I say? What, what verse did we stop at? 11, didn't we? Like, uh, he says, likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, mm -hmm. but alive unto God through who? Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Let not sin therefore reign, or let it, ha let it not have rulership. Can the church say amen? Let it not rule or reign in your mortal bodies. Because I made the point before in another Bible study that what happens is that the flesh knows that it does not have to pay the price for what it does. Anybody ever wrote a check in here? Underneath your check, it is, called, it is, it is what is called a carbon copy. On the check, you, you write on the check, but underneath is that carbon copy that copies whatever you write. See, the flesh is like the check. Praise the Lord. The, f the flesh is writing checks, but the carbon copy, the imprint, is, is not on the flesh. Okay. It is on the carbon copy or the soul. And that's the way God looks at it because the, because the flesh is going to die. It knows it's going back to the grave. That's right. but, it's, but the flesh tells the spirit, I'm going to the party tonight. I don't know where you're going, but I'm going to the party. So what do we have to do? We got to tell the, the, we, the spirit has to tell the flesh, no, you're not going to the party. You're going to the house of God. You catch, you catch what I'm saying? That's the analogy. Is that the flesh knows that it does not have to pay for anything it does. From dust thou art, and dust thou shall return. Can the church say amen? And remember this, the carnal man is selfish. It only wants what it wants. The, your Bible said that it's never full of seeing and never full of wanting. Can the church say amen? amen. It always wants more. Can the church say hallelujah? hallelujah? All right. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Mm -hmm. Yield, uh, he said, neither yield ye your members as instruments. That term instruments means tools. Your body is a tool. Just like those of us who work and we have different instruments that we work with, they're tools. Praise the Lord. Your body is a tool. It is an instrument. Read. Of what? Unrighteousness unto sin. Read. But yield, yourse yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Now, we, were, we are alive from the dead because every man that is born is born a dead man. A man is born marching to his grave. And I don't mean to be morbid tonight. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just simply making the point because David tells us, um, um, I was entangled, as it were, from the womb. Can the church say amen? I go, as it were, forth, if, he's, if I'm saying it right, a whoring, as it were. I go forth from the womb um, in my carnal nature. Now, I'm going to give you an illustration so you can understand why I said that. Somebody say, you know, we love babies because of who they are. No saints, we love babies because of what is in us. 
Because babies, whether we know it or not, and they are cute, cuddly, and wonderful, and lovely, but babies, when they're born, tell you and show you who they are. Can the church say amen? Children, let me give you an example. You have a child. He's in his crib. He's screaming his head off, hollering and screaming and going like somebody's trying to kill him. You go in the room, you check him, you check his diaper, you give him a bottle, he doesn't want anything to eat. You turn around, you cut the light off, he gets to screaming again. Praise the Lord. You go back in the room, and as soon as you pick him up, he stopped crying. Know what he was doing? He was lying to you, and before you even taught him, before he even learned how to lie. Because there was nothing wrong with him. Get a church, say amen. Praise the Lord. Now, when I was growing up, I don't know if you guys remember that, those hard white shoes. Remember those hard white shoes you used to wear? They get upset, and they'll kick you with them, scratch your eyeballs out. So you love children, you love babies because what is in you. Because a baby wants what it wants. Can the church say amen? And I'm simply giving you that illustration to show you the nature that is in us from birth. And what do we do as our children grow? We try to teach them things to help combat the nature that they had. From who? Adam. Can the church say amen? Read. What did I say here? And your members as instruments of righteousness under God. Now that is accomplishable through the new birth experience. Now I can yield my members as instruments of righteousness unto God through what? The Spirit. Can the church say amen? amen. And fasting and prayer is an assist to the, uh, to the baptism of the Holy Ghost in us to get the job done. Can the church say amen? And this is what this principle is going to talk about tonight. It's going to talk about how do I assist in, to get the job done in revenge against myself. Can the church say amen? amen. Let's go to Peter. I want to give you this scripture here. Let's go to Peter. Chapters number one. First Peter chapters number three. I'm sorry. First Peter chapters number three. And we want uh, verses number one and two. Can the church say amen? God loves us today. Praise the Lord. And I don't mean to be harsh tonight, but um, this is this what um, the scripture is talking about. Can the church say amen? amen? All right. Let's look at what Peter says. Now he's going to draw a contrast here between the suffering of Christ in that which we go through. Can the church say amen? Read here, verse number one. Mm -hmm. There you in the right way. First Peter, right? Four. I see. First Peter, I'm sorry, four. I told you three, didn't I? I'm so sorry. I want it. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us. In what? The flesh. How did he suffer? We read the scripture last week. That, as it were, he was despised and rejected. He was a man of sorrow. That's in, um, that would be in Isaiah chapters number 53. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrow was acquainted with grief, and we, as it were, hid our faces from him. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are what? Healed. This is how he suffered. Can the church say amen? He suffered in his mortal body. Praise the Lord. And also, Jesus took revenge against his body. He was God. Did not he fast for 40 days and 40 nights? Can the church say amen? Read. Arm yourself likewise with the same mind. Jesus said it, I mean, Paul said it like this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. So the same mind that Jesus had is the same mind that we are supposed to be, supposed to have, or supposed to be like-minded to. Can the church say amen? So how Jesus dealt with things is the way that I deal with things. How Jesus walked is the way that I walk. How Jesus talked is the way that I talk. If Jesus suffered, I'm not going to get out of it. Can the church say amen? And we're going to see how we suffer. Read. For he that has suffered in the flesh has what? Seed from sin. See, don't let anybody tell you that when you stopped sinning, you didn't go through some suffering. Trust me, we did. The withdrawals, the issues, praise the Lord, this is what he's talking about. 
they had to take revenge. They had to fight against that which was offensive. And the way they did it was that they suffered in the flesh and they ceased from the practices that caused the problem in the first place. So when, let me give an example. We talked about when the first chapter, there was division. There was a rebellion. They rebelled against Apollos and those that were put in uh, charge of them as um, Paul instructed Apollos and the ministry that he set in charge. Praise the Lord. So they had to suffer and listen and follow the instruction that was given to them. Can the church say amen? There is suffering that happens. But with the suffering, God grants us a measure of reprieve through the Spirit to go through and walk with God. Because we know that at the end of this life, we have something laid up for us. Paul said it like this, that as it were, the present suffering of this day is not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. I have glory, we have glory saints on the other side of this veil of tears. We got something that's laid up for us, that God has laid up for, for us that no other dispensation has ever had the way we have it. Can the church say amen? Do you not know that there's no other dispensation that has ever had the Spirit of God living on the inside of them? The prophets didn't have the Holy Ghost. Can the church say amen? amen. Moses did not have the Holy Ghost. We're going to talk about Moses in a minute. Abraham did not have the Holy Spirit. David, Joshua, and all the rest of them. Can the church say amen? But the Bible said we have, as it were, this treasure, and that's talking about the, the Word of God, of course, but it is a treasure. We have something on the inside of us, praise God, that keeps us. And through that keeping us, saints, our mind can be like-minded. See, sometimes what God does, he shifts our mental disposition. And I tell people this all the time, that what God will do, he may not change your surroundings, but he'll change the way we think about our surroundings. Can the church say amen? I've told you about a situation. I was at, uh, on my job one time years ago, and there was a man that came up to me. I thought he was going to hit me. I didn't know what, the, what was wrong. He, he, God was crazy, losing his mind. Praise the Lord. And he was just screaming and spitting and just going bananas. And he was the one that was wrong. I was, I was helping him. He was sleeping at home, getting drunk, and then he come to work. And I was doing his job. And then when, you, when he messed up, he blamed me. Praise the Lord. But I, you know, okay, if you want to holler and scream, that's fine. But if you mess with me, I'm not going to do nothing to you. But I don't know what God will do. Amen. I'll tell you that. I don't know what God will do, but I know what I'm not going to do. So I had to suffer the persecution that was coming against me. And it got to a point that I had to break him and another guy up for, from fighting or getting ready to fight about what, he, what the guy said to me. I'm like, he didn't say it to you, he said it to me, so why you want to fight him? Don't let him talk to you like that. Well, I'm, brother, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. Leave it alone. Can the church say amen? So the point being is that we have to be like-minded. This is what this scripture is talking about. The same suffering that Jesus went through, we have to be like-minded in the spirit to, to, to say, okay, Lord, if I have to go through it, you'll get me through it. Because in, in actuality, we are not suffering as the, as the saints of old suffered. Praise the Lord. Can the church say amen? All right, let's keep moving on here because we got a few scriptures to get to. I told you we were going to get to Moses. Let's look at Moses. Let's look how Moses was willing to do the job that God wanted him to do. Can the church say amen? Let's go to, um, let's see here. Hebrew, Hebrews, chapters numbers 11 and verses numbers 24 and 25 and 26. Praise the Lord. All right. We're talking about revenge tonight. Can the church say amen? This is what we call the roster of the faithful. Can the church say hallelujah? Let me see, let me, let's look at this tonight. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh's daughter and chose 
choosing rather to suffer with the people of God. The people of God, of course, were the children of Israel. Now, the Bible said that it came to his heart to go to his brothers. And you know when it came to his heart? He was 40 years old. He was raised in the house of Pharaoh. He had all of the fineries of life. He had everything that life could afford. He was actually in line to take the throne of Pharaoh. Praise the Lord. But he made a conscious choice. He made a conscious decision. This is what all of us have to do. We have to make decisions. Life is about choices. God doesn't make the choices for me. I make the choices. Praise the Lord. God t somebody said, well, God told me to put that shirt on. God didn't tell you to put that shirt on. You put that shirt on. Some people think like this. God told me to, to, to do this. And God, some things God inspires your mind to do. The Bible said there's a spirit of man and inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Some things God just give me common sense to get, get the job done. Can the church say amen? He's built that in us. We are, we are intelligent creatures that he's given us some, some ability to do certain things. Can the church say amen? So when he says here, when he was come to years, this has to do when it came into his heart to go to his brethren. And, but what he failed to realize was that God was not sending him, praise God. God was urging him to make a change. He went to his brother, and he prematurely tried to judge before he was really, somebody say, prepared. Can the church say amen? So God took Moses and put him on the backside of the desert for how many years? Forty years to what? Prepare him. And don't, you, don't think for one minute there was not some suffering, there was not some reproach, some things he had to bear to get what prepared. And then once he got to the job, he really had to go through. Can the church say hallelujah? Praise the Lord. And there were times when he had to, of course, he would have had to humble himself and come down. Can the church say amen? That's the reason why we're reading this. This to show the fact that there are times when a man has to bring who he is now. Now think about it like this. He was raised 40 years at the best schools. He ate the best food. He had the best teachers. He, he was in line for the greatest kingdom in the world at that time. But he made a choice to say, I'm going to suffer with the children of God. He made a choice that I'm going to follow God. Or I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Can the church say amen? So there's choices that we had to make. The Corinthian saints, saints had to make a choice. Are we going to follow what, the, what uh, Paul instructed us to do? Or are we going to do it our way? Can the church say amen? Moses chose. God didn't make Moses do it. He chose. Can the church say amen? Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of who? God, then to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Did not, did not, when we started this, I talked about time. There's a time for everything. Now, there's a time for you to enjoy anything in life. You remember, think about that for a minute. There's some things, saints, that I enjoyed when I was 15 that I no longer enjoy today. And I can't do today. I used to play football. Notice I've said I used to. But do you see me trying to try out for the Lions? No, sir. They will kill me. You hear what I'm telling you? That was a time and season. Can the church say amen? So there's a time and season for everything. My point, my point that I'm getting to is this. He chose rather to suffer with the children of God, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. The, the pleasures of sin is only for a season. Can the church say amen? There's some things that are pleasurable, and don't, don't, don't kid yourself. There's some things that are pleasurable out there in the world. But remember this, it is only for a season. And it is only for a season from this standpoint also, how long you can enjoy it. Because there are certain things that even if we wanted to do, and we get to a certain age, we can't enjoy it anyway. <laughs> Somebody say, he's talking good today. Praise the Lord. Isn't that right, Bishop? 
So when people say, well, no, I don't do this, I don't do that, is it because you don't desire to do it or you just can't do it anyway? You see? Praise the Lord. So there's a choice here. Read, let's keep reading here, all right? Esteeming the reproach of who? Christ. Did not I say Christ was in the wilderness? He was a rock that followed them. Christ was back there in the wilderness, and he would rather suffer with the, with the children of God and uh, then enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the, uh, what did he say, greater than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. There was a reward, praise God. There was a recompense, and he had respect unto it. Can the church say amen? He understood that the recompense that could have come through not following God and the reward that God wanted to give us was greater than, a per than him not following God. So he esteemed, saints, look at this, he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater. In the church, say, man, greater, greater. Whatever we have to go through in this life is better than anything than this life can offer us outside of walking with God. Anything I got to deal with, it doesn't matter. Because God has blessed my quality of life far beyond anything I could ever imagine. Can the church say, man, my quality of life has changed dramatically. Can the church say, man? I have joy. I'm happy. I don't walk down the street, look over my shoulder, who's following me, who's watching me. Who, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Because God has given us something, saints, that's far better than anything we ever could have got in the world. Can the church say amen? So the reproach of Christ is far greater than the pleasures of this world only for a season. Because a man's life may only be three score and ten. If by reason of strength, they be, may be, they, they may, uh, it will be four score. That's what your scripture said. And my Bible said that wicked man shall not live out half their days. If you do the statistics, the world statistics, I'm not talking about in America. Men's lifespan, I'm talking about all around the world, is about 35 years of age. Do the, do the math. You can go out there, you can, you can research it. I'm not talking about in America because we have a better quality of life. But when you take into account all of the killing, the malnutrition, disease, and famine, and all the things that are around the world, it is about 35 years of age. Can the church say amen? You know why? Because this Bible is right. So I would rather be what God wants me to be and take restitution, revenge, against my flesh than to fall out of the will of God. Let's keep moving on here. Can the church say hallelujah? hallelujah. Romans chapters numbers um, 2. Let's look, at, let's look at this here. I want to point out four things that God gives us. Can the church say hallelujah? This is the last Bible study we're going to have on this, and we're going to be teaching something else next week. Amen. Can the church say Amen. Praise the Lord. I want two. And let's see here. Um, verses numbers uh, two through four is what we, what we want tonight. Romans two, two through four. Church say amen. amen. Let's read here. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Now, those such things, if you read in the chapter above, you'll see exactly what he's talking about. Read. And thinketh thou this, O man, that judgeth them would do such things, and uh, doeth the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Now, this is an example of one who is living in hypocrisy. For if I judge... And I do the same thing. I am what the Bible calls a hypocrite. And the Bible said the hope of the hypocrite, what? Faileth. Can the church say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Read. Or despiseth thou the riches of his goodness. Now, he's going to tell you what those riches of his goodness is. And forbearance and long suffering, mm -hmm, no suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God 
leadeth thee to repentance. So it is his goodness, it is his forbearance, it is his long suffering, suffering what, that leadeth us to repentance. This is how a man repents. This is how the Corinthian church repented after the first letter that Paul wrote to them. It was God's goodness. And after they felt the goodness of God, they were willing to change their, rec- change their conduct. And thereby, God granting them, as it were, that which they needed to help them. Can the church say amen? One has to change one's conduct. And that's what this whole Bible study, these six Bible studies that we taught on these seven fruit were all about. It was about the fact that when a person is in a condition that they need to repent, they have to manifest the fruits. But they first have to acknowledge that it's God that is leading them to the place to have a desire to even want to change. See, people don't repent because they just think about repenting. This, this scripture said it is his goodness. It, what? His forbearance. That has to do with he forbears. As it were, when he could judge, he forbears judgment. Long suffering. He suffers long. He waits. This is what he does. God will wait on men. Praise God for days, months, years at a time to get them to see that I am being gracious and good to you to give you an opportunity in the first place. This is what he does. When I first, when I came to God, I came, I'm gonna tell you, I'll give you my testimony. When I came into the church, I came to the church because Elder Shaw kept telling me, you need to come to church. And then when I came, when I, when I said, I'm going to come to church to get this guy off my back. And as I'm riding in the seat with my boy, with my friend, I mean, I don't want to be talk Ebonics tonight, but when I was riding in the seat with my, my friend, I was like, you know, okay, we'll check out these girls in the church. See, I wasn't thinking about being saved. You, you hear what I'm saying? I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I was not, I had no mind to be saved. But you know what? When I came into the church, I ran into some goodness. And his goodness led me to say, I need to be saved. And if we be honest with ourselves, we will say when we, some, when we came in the church, we did not always have a mind to do the right thing. Because I wasn't trying to be saved, trust me. But God was trying to save me. Can the church say amen? So I understand this scripture. <laughs> I get this one because I wasn't looking for Jesus. But Jesus was looking for me. And I'm going to tell you something. God knows how to come right down Main Street. He'll come right through your front door. He'll get up on your porch. He'll beat the door down. He'll flip the mattress over. He'll open up the closet. He goes right where we need it. Why? Because it is his goodness that leadeth. So when we start crying... When we feel the urge of God, somebody say, that's his goodness. goodness. Can the church say amen? All right, let's keep moving on here. I only got about 15 minutes. I'm almost done tonight. Let's go to Isaiah. Let's look at an example. I told you we're going to talk about um, the act of taking, uh, let's see here, restitution and vindication, which is one tool that God gives us is fasting. Let's go to Isaiah. This will probably be our last scripture tonight, because I don't think I'm going to get to the other one. Isaiah 58. Can the church say amen? Isaiah 58. Now, this is instruction, of course, to the children of Israel, but it is applicable to us today. Can the church say amen? Now, sometimes we need some assistance to get the job done. This is how God helps assist us to get the job done in our life. Praise the Lord. Verses number 1, 58th chapter. Read. Cry loud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trump in Zion. Mm -hmm. Show my people their uh, transgressions in the house of Israel their sins. Now, this is instruction to, of course, Isaiah. And it is also instruction to us today, those of us who blow the trumpet in Zion, the ministry. Read. Yet they seek me daily mm -hmm, and delight to know my ways. Read. As a nation that did righteousness and forsook not 
the ordinances of their God. Now, there was, I think I told you, there were 613 ordinances of worship. Read. They asked to meet uh, ordinances of, ju of, of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Now, uh, let's stop right there. Verses numbers 2, as you're going to read here, was simply an outward show. It was an outward show. It was not given with the right attitude. They were seeking God. They wanted to know his ordinances, as it were. They sought him daily, but they did not seek him the right way. See, a person can, be, can seemingly act like they're coming to God, but their heart is not in the right place. This is, the, this is what um, Isaiah is telling the children of Israel. They were seeking to know his ways, praise God. They were having an outward show. But their hearts, as one writer said, was far from him. See, God does not look at us the way we look at one another. God looks at the inward man. He looks at the heart condition. And then once, when the heart condition is in the right place, and our actions is following the heart condition that is in the right place, we will be accepted. So from verses numbers 2, it looked like they were doing a good job. But God was saying... You were doing all of this in an unacceptable fashion. Why? Because, and we're going to read here, when they were doing their fast, when they were seeking him to get the understanding of those ordinances, those uh, things that God wanted to give them, they were doing it the wrong way. See, a person can be sincerely wrong. You understand what I'm saying? A person can be trying to do right and actually don't know they're doing wrong. But these Jews that uh, Isaiah is talking to, they're in a place where they were seeking God, but they weren't doing it the right way. And God looked at their heart condition. Read here. Wherefore have, mm -hmm, have we fasted? Say they. This is what they said. And thou seest not. God was not looking at it. Read. Wherefore have we afflicted our soul? Read. And thou takest no knowledge. Behold, the day, uh, the day of your fast, ye exact, uh, ye, uh, fine pleasure, excuse me, and exact your labor. That's offense number one. What did he say? Ye find pleasure. And what? Exact your labor. Let me bring it home to us. When we fast, saints, we do our daily routine as we would do it in a normal fashion. We don't seek pleasures because the, the point of fasting is to, is to cause the flesh to suffer. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you like eating ice cream, you don't eat ice cream that oh, Of course, you can't do it because you're fasting. But if it's something that, ple that, you have, um, that you enjoy doing, you dedicate that. And this is what he's talking about. They were fasting and having, how can I say, um, doing things that brought pleasure to their, to their carnal man. It was counterproductive to what God wanted to do for them, to what they were actually seeking God for. They exact their labors. What that means is that when they were fasting, they, didn't, they did not do their daily tasks. Can the church say amen? If a person fasts and, you, and you're supposed to go to work, you go to work that day. Can the church say amen? That's bringing it home to us. So if they were fasting and they had to plow their fields, they were supposed to continue to plow their fields. They were not supposed to exact their labor. So this is the reason why he's saying that your, as it were, your coming to me is unacceptable because you didn't do it in the right fashion. Can the church say amen? So you can, person, a person can have good intentions, but have good intentions in the wrong way, in the wrong manner. Can the church say amen? Read. Behold ye fast for strife, what? Uh, he said for strife and debate. Read. And to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day mm -hmm, to make your voice to be heard on high. 
They were fasting from, uh, from the, uh, on a, uh, how can I say it, from an outward show for strife and debate. They were fasting from out of, a car, out of uh, the carnality of their hearts. Can the church say amen? It was not sincere. It was not genuine. Can the church say amen? Read here. Let's keep going on. For such a fast, uh-huh, that uh, I have chosen that a man, mm-hmm, uh, for a man, excuse me, in the day, for a man to afflict what? His soul. So what is fasting designed to do? Afflict your soul. So the seven fruit of repentance has to do with one coming down. And this is the only way for a person to truly come down. You have to afflict your soul. Can the church say amen? Don't think for one minute when Paul wrote that letter to them the first time that there was not some fasting going on. There was some mourning. There was some coming down. Can the church say amen? And there was some an affliction of the soul. Can the church say amen? Now, let me give you this. I'm going to see if you, uh, if you were paying attention in Wednesday night Bible study. What was the Day of Atonement called in your Bible also? A day that a man afflict his soul. Can the church say amen? The Day of Atonement. We was talking about that Wednesday, right? The Day of Atonement. It was also called the day that a man afflicted his soul. So on the Day of Atonement, they were what? Fasting. It was the Sabbath day. They were fasting. They were afflicting their soul. They were calling back to mind the transgressions of old and making a change. Can the church say amen? So this is important. Praise the Lord. Whenever a person is in a condition where they have transgressed the law of God, fasting is always important. To afflict one's person. Can the church say amen? To put the punishment on the individual that did the wrong. And know what the individual was? It was me. Can the church say amen? I did it. It wasn't the devil. It was me. I, I, I say this all the time, bitch. If I came up to you and punched you in the face, I can't blame that on the devil. Somebody say, Flip Wilson said the devil made me do it. That's a lie. Praise the Lord. It was me. I did it, and now I need to afflict my soul. I need to apologize. I need to bring my flesh under subjection to the spirit. Can the church say amen? This is how it's done. All right, let's keep reading here. We're almost done. I got about five minutes. I got to blow through this here. Is it to bow, uh, is it to bow down? The head as a bull rush, read, and to spread sackcloth and ashes. This was a ceremonial thing that they did during their fast. It was to, um, how can I say it? It was to uh, symbolize mourning and recalling back to mind transgression, as it were. Read. Will you call this a fast? Mm hmm. And an acceptable day of the Lord. Read. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? Now, this is the fast that God chooses. Read. To loose the bands of wickedness, number one. To undo the heavy burdens, number two. To let the oppressed go free, that's uh, number three. And that ye break every yoke, that's number four. Can the church say hallelujah? Let's keep reading. Is this not to deal? No, no, let's stop right there. I'm, I'm sorry. Now, this, verse number six. This is the fast that he's chosen. This is what fasting will do. Can the church say amen? Fasting that is done in order with God. It will break yokes. It will loose the bands of wickedness. It will undo heavy burdens. Praise the Lord. It will allow oppression to be released, and we will not be, have a yoke upon us. That has to do with we will not be under labor, the load of sin, the load of one writer said it like this, um, that we have to lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily what beset us. Now read verse number seven. Mm -hmm. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? This has to do with now when we fast properly, God opens us up and our compassion comes out. Read. Is it not to deal uh, thy bread to the hungry? Mm-hmm. And to bring uh, thou, um, bring thou, uh, and that thou bring the poor that is cast out into thy house. Read. When thou seest 
when thou, when thou seest the naked, that thou coverest him, mm -hmm, and that thou hide not thyself from thyself. So this is what happens. Fasting, saints, has an effect of how God blesses us in our own selves and how we can affect and bless someone else. The latter part of this uh, particular, how can I say it, this, this particular part of fasting has to do with what we can do for others. Amen. The first part of it has to do with what God does for us. Can the church say amen? amen. All right, let's keep reading here. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning read, and thy health shall spring forth speedily read. Thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward, read. Then shall, thy, uh, then shall thou call, the Lord shall answer. Now, this is what happens. Somebody say, why is not God answering me? He's not answering me sometimes because I've not offered to him what he, want, what he wants. Can the church say amen? So when a person fasts, they are looking for a response. People don't fast for no reason. People fast because they want something. Can the church say amen? But if we fast in the right fashion, these are the things that will happen. Now, I didn't get a chance to really teach it. We can deal with these principles step by step, but I only have a few minutes. But to give you the, the sense of what he's talking about, when a person offers to God in their fast that which he wants, seeks restitution against their nature, vindication against their flesh, they will get a reward. They will get the desired result for that which they seek. Amen. Can the church say amen? So to end this Bible study, this is exactly what the last fruit teaches us in terms of what we're supposed to do and the result that we can get from God. The Corinthian church saints got the desired result when they came down and gave God, as it were, what he wanted and offered to God that which he desired, and those fruits were manifest in their life. Can the church say amen? And the last fruit is what? Revenge. Can the church say amen? And this is the primary way that all men take revenge upon their nature. This is a tool that God gives us. Can the church say hallelujah? This is a tool. Prayer is a tool. Fasting is a tool. And sometimes we have to take the instruments that God gives us and use them to his glory. Can the church say amen? It hurts sometimes, but nevertheless, it is good. Anybody have any questions tonight? Praise the Lord. All right. If there are no uh, questions, do we have our uh, announcements?